On Question Time tonight, one of the boldest war correspondents, Marie Colvin of the Sunday Times, the Virgin Rail and Airline boss, Richard Branson, the chairman of the Labour Party who says alarm bells are ringing for the government, Charles Clark, Tory transport spokesman, Theresa May, and the editor of the Mirror, Piers Morgan, answering questions in Norwich tonight, here on BBC One, after the news. This is BBC One in Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. Now the news at 10 o'clock with Michael Burke and Ian White. Last stand for the Taliban. They say they'll fight to the death. The key eastern city of Jalalabad is the latest to fall to local warlords. The Americans say the noose is tightening around bin Laden and his men. Free and safe, the Western aid workers who've escaped from the Taliban. Anti-terrorist police arrest six people over the London and Birmingham bombings. And tomorrow, the world. The Irish celebrate winning through to the World Cup. And here in Yorkshire, controlled explosions and homes evacuated as anti-terrorist police seal off a village near Leeds. We'll have the latest from the scene. And it's no surprise, Terry Yorath is appointed manager of Sheffield Wednesday. Good evening. The Taliban are still falling back on their strongholds tonight, apparently intent on a last stand against their enemies. Their leader, Mullah Omar, said they would fight to the death rather than to surrender to what he called fascists. The situation on the ground is confused, but it appears most of Afghanistan is now in the hands of the Northern Alliance or local warlords. In a moment, John Simpson in Kabul on new evidence of the extent of bin Laden's terror network. But first, Ben Brown from Jalalabad. He was one of the first reporters in after this important eastern city fell. We drove into southern Afghanistan through the Khyber Pass. Refugees crammed the road, desperate to get home. We were told the route to Jalalabad could still be dangerous. There might be Taliban troops here who had just retreated from the city that was their stronghold. There was some gunfire, but it was only in celebration. And jubilant crowds lined the road. As night fell, we arrived in the centre of Jalalabad and found heavily armed fighters ecstatic in their victory. They seized control from the Taliban yesterday, but never engaged them in battle. The Taliban just fled. The Americans have been bombing them right up until they left. The terrorists have finished, this fighter told me. They ran away. They've gone up into the mountains far away from the city. As you can see, this city is brimming with guns and gunmen. But in the end, our understanding is Jalalabad fell with hardly a shot being fired. The Taliban simply turned and ran. The question now is who is going to replace them as the government of this beleaguered nation? Amid the splendor of the palace in Jalalabad, a meeting tonight of the commanders and tribal leaders who now run this city. They are not the Northern Alliance. They are another anti-Taliban faction from the Pashtun ethnic group. They want to establish that Jalalabad is theirs now, not the Northern Alliance's. And the Pashtuns are demanding a hefty slice of power in the new Afghanistan. Outside the governor's palace this evening, an expectant crowd have gathered. They can hardly believe Jalalabad has fallen to them. After all, it was around here that Osama bin Laden himself spent much of his time and established many of his terrorist training camps. Now the challenge for all the victorious factions is to work with each other rather than wage war on each other, as they have done all too often in the past. Ben Brown, BBC News, Jalalabad. In the last few minutes, it's been reported that around 100 British Royal Marines have flown into the Bagram Air Base outside Kabul. They're there to secure it as a base for future operations. In Kabul itself, more evidence has emerged today of the sinister ambitions of Osama bin Laden's terrorist network. John Simpson has been to one of its training centres in the city. You know things are getting back to a kind of normality here when people start stripping down the wrecks left over from the fighting. This car was hit on Monday night by a rocket fired from an American helicopter. It contained four Arabs, all heavily armed and heading for the front line. They all died. 
The four had just left a house around the corner, which wasn't attacked by the Americans. Presumably they didn't know about it. Once it was used by the Saudi embassy, and then by the UN. A year or so ago, it became a reception center for foreign volunteers coming to fight for the Taliban. Inside, it's a mess. We found that the Afghan Secret Service had been here before us. They'd taken away large amounts of documents, which will presumably find their way to the Americans and British. But they left quite a lot behind. Weapons and explosives, for example. There are hand grenades everywhere. For some reason, the volunteers hadn't taken them with them. But they had been trained here to use them. This wasn't just a reception center. The volunteers seemed to have been taught to use weapons, and the Pakistanis among them were taught the rudiments of Arabic. But who precisely were they? And this hat is interesting. On it, it says Al Sayaka, which is the new name for the Al Qaeda organization, which is Bin Laden's group. Maybe it was just coincidence, but there were some box cutters lying around. The weapon the hijackers used to take over the planes in the attacks of September the 11th. There's a pile of documents here which we found which haven't been taken away by the security authorities. Personal files. Here there's a passport from the Sudan. These were basically just small fry. Elsewhere, though, documents are coming to light which show how dangerous Bin Laden's Al-Qaeda network aspired to be. This one describes how to create a thermonuclear explosion. These are notes on building a missile. Ricin is a powerful poison, first developed by the Soviet KGB. As we left, they were clearing up the things the Taliban volunteers had left behind. Maybe the really dangerous sounding documents on nuclear fission and missiles were just fantasy. But we can't yet be absolutely sure. John Simpson, BBC News, Kabul. Northern Alliance forces have been accused of killing hundreds of Taliban soldiers trapped inside a school building in the battle for the northern city of Mazari Sharif. Reuters pictures from the city appear to show the demolished building and bodies removed from the wreckage. Scores of Taliban soldiers have been taken prisoner by Northern Alliance troops. Opposition forces are now in control of most key towns in the north of Afghanistan, except Kunduz, where thousands of Taliban soldiers are still holding out. Well, Ben Brown's in Jalalabad now. Ben, the, the collapse of the Taliban is creating a pretty confused situation on the ground. Yes, Mike, very confused, and especially around here. We're, we're not sure quite where the Taliban are. We know they've gone into retreat. But uh, you have to be very careful driving around the roads here because you're not quite sure when they're going to be around the corner. In Jalalabad itself, it was um, quite a, a straightforward handover of power, almost gentlemanly, in fact. Um, the Taliban left at 12 noon yesterday, and the old Mujahideen commanders uh, who used to be in charge here just moved in. But um, there are no bodies in the gutters here. That there are no Taliban being held in the jails. Uh, there was no violence at all. It, it, Jalalabad just fell without a fight, and the the people here, I must say, are, are heartily relieved and and heartily grateful that there was no battle here. But the Taliban are saying that they're going to fight to the death. Is there any sign of them doing that? Well, certainly not here. I mean, they just they just left the city completely without a fight, and despite all that rhetoric of uh, jihad and holy war and them fighting to the last drop of blood. No sign of it here at all. Um, but as you were reporting in Kunduz, up in the north, we, we're hearing that 2,000 of, if not the Taliban, certainly their Arab allies, are fighting uh, very hard indeed, um, surrounded by the Northern Alliance, but ferociously fighting street battles, according to the Americans. But that, that appears to be almost the exception rather than the rule, and uh, one of the few cases where the Taliban and their allies really are fighting hard still. Ben, thanks. The focus of international attention now is the southern city of Kandahar, the Taliban's main stronghold. In an exclusive interview with the BBC, the Taliban leader, Mullah Mohammed Omar, was defiant, threatening the destruction of America. From the Afghan border near the Pakistani town of Quetta, Matt Fry reports. Pristine skies, but still full of menace. 
here an American fighter on the prowl near Kandahar. On the ground, the Pakistani border troops are edgy. More reinforcements were sent in today. The Taliban stronghold of Kandahar is only two hours' drive from here, but because foreign journalists are barred, this is as close as we can get. These are the latest pictures from Al Jazeera television of the city itself. They appear to show the Taliban still in control, patrolling the streets. Defiance also from their reclusive leader, Mullah Omar. He rang the BBC World Service today on a satellite phone to give an extremely rare interview. The current situation is related to a big cause, he said, and that is the destruction of America. This is the plan, and God willing, it will be implemented soon. Keep in mind this prediction, he warned. On the border, the Taliban troops are still in evidence, and so are their weapons. We saw this pickup truck loaded with grenade launchers. If the Taliban make good their promise to fight a guerrilla war, these are the kind of weapons that British and American soldiers will have to face in the mountains. But there are also signs that morale is collapsing. We came across this desperate throng of Afghan men at the border gates. Apparently, these are Taliban fighters who've downed their weapons and now want to flee their country. Like this man, waiting in a refugee camp to be treated for burns, apparently from an American bomb. No appetite here for more war. The coalition is still confronted by what could become a nightmare scenario. Afghanistan, now a country in chaos and turmoil, an impending guerrilla war with the remnants of the Taliban, and Osama bin Laden and his terrorists hiding in the hills as elusive as ever. Matt Fry, BBC News, Quetta. The American government says 50 to 60 percent of Afghanistan is now under opposition control and that the noose is tightening around Osama bin Laden. Pentagon officials also say that some members of the Al-Qaeda terrorist network have been killed during U.S. airstrikes. Well, Gavin Hewitt's in Washington. Gavin, what, what, are the Pentagon, what is the Pentagon assessment of its war on terrorism tonight? Well, the commander of the whole operation was here in Washington today and uh, deciding what happens next. First of all, there's going to be less emphasis on bombing and what bombing there is will be more focused. Uh, the real emphasis now will be on the hunt, the hunt for Osama bin Laden. And that's going to depend on special forces. Now, my understanding, there are between 100 and 150 American special forces in southern Afghanistan alone. They are putting up uh, roadblocks. They're not at this stage going uh, to the caves looking for him. They're, they're essentially hunting for intelligence. Are they any closer to getting him, then? Well, the mood here in town is pretty optimistic. Uh, General Tommy Franks was saying today, uh, the noose is tightening, we think we're going to destroy him. And uh, what they're depending upon is that someone cracking and pinpointing precisely where he is. American planes have been dropping leaflets reminding people there is a, a, um, a reward of $25 million for anybody who gives information uh, describing where Osama bin Laden is. Uh, and also what they're doing is actually, as I understand it, sitting down and meeting some people who they think close to the Taliban who might be able to indicate whether there is a deal to be done, someone who might be willing to betray Osama bin Laden. But what if he, it gets too hot and he just simply slips across the border to another country? Well, that's one of the things that's been worrying uh, the Defence Secretary here, Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, in the last 24 hours, he said he still has the capacity to get in a helicopter and perhaps go up a gorge and fly to Pakistan. Uh, but also today, there was a warning from the Vice President Dick Cheney, in fact, talking to the BBC. Uh, he gave uh, a warning to any country that might be tempted to harbour bin Laden, and he said, we will use uh, American military power. Uh, so it's quite clear that any country that takes Osama bin Laden should expect to see American and coalition planes overhead. Gavin, thanks very much. The long ordeal of eight Western aid workers held hostage by the Taliban in Afghanistan is over. They were freed after Northern Alliance forces stumbled across them in a jail 90 miles south of Kabul, where they'd been abandoned by fleeing Taliban soldiers. American special forces were scrambled to helicopter them to safety. Into Pakistan, free after three months of detention at the hands of the Taliban, the aid workers were taken to their embassies to be reunited with family and friends. Their relief and joy self-evident. It's like a miracle because uh, 
just before Kabul fell, we were so excited to get out. We heard already the troops coming in, and then the Taliban came in and took us away, and took us in a vehicle and wanted to take us to Kandahar. And we knew if you end up in Kandahar, we would not probably survive there. And Having been driven south from Kabul, they were held inside a freezing shipping container before being put into a jail in the town of Ghazni. On Tuesday, as US bombs fell, an uprising began and anti-Taliban fighters broke in to release them. The Red Cross was contacted, US Special Forces helicopters flew to airlift them to safety. The workers were held in August, accused of preaching Christianity, a serious offence under the Taliban's harsh Islamic rule. In America, people in their communities had prayed night and day for their freedom. We're, we're delighted. Um, this is the best outcome. It's the one we've hoped for all along, but frankly, we've been pretty discouraged. U.S. sources say the Taliban had agreed to turn the aid workers over, but the sheer speed of the Northern Alliance advance overran the plans. Clarence Mitchell, BBC News. Well, more now on the news that British soldiers are tonight at Bagram Airport outside Kabul. Rita Chakrabarti is at Westminster now. Rita, what, what are they saying about this mission? What's it for? Well, we've had no official confirmation yet from the Ministry of Defence, but uh, defence sources have said that up to 100 troops from 45 Royal Marine Commando landed at noon British time at Bagram Airport. Now, they are there to clear a path for a larger humanitarian mission. We know that there are several thousand British troops on 48 hours standby. This is not part of those troops. They are an advance party, if you like, who are being sent so that any larger deployment isn't sent in blind. But this is, I think, an indication that that larger deployment really is imminent. Rita, thanks. Six people are being questioned tonight in connection with a 17-month terrorist bombing campaign by the real IRA. Armed police made the arrests after raids on addresses in North London and Liverpool. And a disused farm is now being searched in West Yorkshire. This is the biggest operation ever carried out against the real IRA here in England. Raids at addresses across the country began at dawn and are still ongoing. Anybody hurt? A village in West Yorkshire is at the centre of a major firearms alert tonight. Anti-terrorist and bomb squad officers experienced at dealing with bomb-making equipment have sealed off a disused farm and evacuated part of West Ardsley near Leeds. There's been a series of controlled explosions. Next thing I know, there's somebody knocking at the door, police officer again, saying there's going to be a controlled explosion, can you leave your house? So obviously I did, and we've heard a couple of explosions. I know they have had two explosions uh, we're not letting anybody back at the moment today's operation is the culmination of a lengthy investigation into eight terrorist attacks here including a rocket attack on MI6 bombs at the BBC and at an Ealing shopping centre in London and a car bomb attack in Birmingham six men are now being questioned about the attacks five were arrested today in Enfield in North London and one in Liverpool what we've had is a campaign of some 17 months of bombings, rocket attacks and various different methods of attacking British, tar British mainland targets. Today's events are the first arrests, they are the first major find of any materials and they are the first major searches of any premises. Tonight's developments come after months of frustration in the fight against the real IRA. Its English bombing campaign has threatened to undermine the entire peace process in Northern Ireland. Officers coordinating events from London warn whatever the long-term outcome of today's searches, they're unlikely to stop the bombs altogether. These arrests are the result of a long investigation by anti-terrorist officers and agents from MI5. Police are hoping they'll prove to be a significant breakthrough in the fight against the real IRA. Margaret Gilmore, BBC News, Scotland Yard. The jury in the trial of Roy Whiting, the man accused of murdering the schoolgirl Sarah Payne, was discharged today because of what was called a procedural irregularity. A new jury has been sworn in and the trial at Lewis Crown Court is due to start again tomorrow. Whiting denies kidnapping and murdering the eight-year-old near her grandparents' home in West Sussex in July last year. Anti-abortion campaigners have won a high court challenge to prevent human embryos being cloned for scientific research. The Pro-Life Alliance argued that current laws allow scientists to clone embryos for any purpose, including research into diseases such as multiple sclerosis. Okay. Sir Stanley Carms, the chairman of Dixon's, has been appointed the new treasurer of the Conservative Party. 
He'll replace Lord Ashcroft immediately. Sir Stanley has been a long-standing party donor. At the last election, he gave a quarter of a million pounds of his own money to the party's campaign. President Bush and the Russian President Vladimir Putin ended their Texas summit tonight with warm praise for each other. They discussed the war on terrorism and were reported to have made progress on ending the spread of nuclear weapons. Mr. Bush said they'd built a new relationship that would make our lives better. Two presidents, one Texas country road, and an awful lot of cattle. Today, they went to Crawford High School and seemed like his friends, George and Vladimir, milking the cow. We in Russia have, have known for a long time that Texas is the most important state in the United States. And amid the backslapping, they did important work. Deep cuts in their nuclear arsenals are coming. Global cooperation against terrorism is a mutual interest. There's no doubt that the United States and Russia won't agree on every issue. But you still probably don't agree with your mother on every issue. You still hope her, though, don't you? The key is, is that we establish a relationship between our country strong enough that will endure beyond our presidencies. The U.S. Pentagon missile defense shield is still the sticking point. Uh, on that, President Putin gave no ground, but he suggested an acceptable solution would potentially be found. All in all, an extraordinarily friendly, wet summit. The Putins said the invitation to the Bush Ranch was an honor they would not forget. Sometimes at these summits, it is the mood that matters most. Presidents Bush and Putin didn't resolve all of their differences, but they did lay the foundations for a new era of cooperation. Stephen Sacker, BBC News, Crawford, Texas. Here, a man's been jailed for life at the Old Bailey for murdering a schoolboy 33 years ago. Brian Field, who's 65 and from Solihull in the West Midlands, pleaded guilty to killing 15-year-old Roy Tootle. Field was arrested when samples he gave after a drink-driving incident matched those taken from the murder scene. The convicted pedophile showed no remorse when he admitted killing the schoolboy more than 30 years ago. The teenager was sexually assaulted and strangled. The judge said Roy Tutel was murdered because he was the sole source of evidence. Detectives are now investigating if Brian Field is linked to other suspicious deaths of children and sex attacks spanning 40 years. I believe Brian Field is capable of having committed a number of offences over the years and it's only a future investigation will hopefully determine what these matters are. Roy Tootle normally took the bus home from school, but to find him, he hitched. His body was dumped several miles away, and for decades, remaining members of his family have lived under the shadow of this crime. Everybody went into a sort of their own personal grief, and the communication to the family was lost. They got very, very quiet, and Christmases and so on was never the same again. The breakthrough came this year when scientists matched DNA from the boy's trousers with a sample taken from Field after he was stopped for a routine drink drive offence. The pedophile was arrested at his home ceremony. Here, West Midlands detectives want to question him about the suspicious death of 15 year old Mark Bennington, who was found hanging from a tree. We've gone through 16 odd years of knowing that Mark was murdered. I hope he's somebody somewhere would come forward. Midlands detectives are also investigating the disappearance of two boys on Boxing Day in 1996. But the Tootle file is now closed. The police kept some of his belongings, the money he saved, and other reminders of a life cut short. Stephen Cape, BBC News. Chancellor Gordon Brown has signalled tonight that he intends to introduce new tax breaks for British industry to ease the burden of the global economic slowdown. Our business editor Jeff Randall joins me now from the hotel in central London where the Chancellors have been speaking. Very smart. Uh, Jeff, what's he been saying? Well, in many respects, it was a familiar Gordon Brown type agenda. He talked about all the things that we know about before. He's talked about deepening and widening the enterprise culture. He talked about emphasizing the government's record of fiscal uh, stability. He didn't mention prudence, by the way. And he stressed the need to re-engineer Britain's work ethic. 
it wasn't so much what he said, it was how he said it. He said it with real passion, and he was really talking to his audience tonight, which, frankly, is a, an audience of sceptical business people, many of whom feel very bruised by what's gone on at rail track, many of whom need reassurance that Labour is really with them. At one point, he said, quite astonishingly, he said, I'm here to pay tribute to the company directors, executives and managers on the work that you do, the service to our country you give, the difference you make to the economy, to the employment and prosperity of it. It's astonishing from the Labour Chancellor and it would have had hope of Labour turning this way. Very briefly, uh, Jeff, uh, has it gone down with your, those sceptics there? Well, he didn't receive thunderous applause. It was political applause. But I was sitting on a, a table of businessmen, and during the speech, several of them whispered to me, good speech, this is what we wanted to hear. We needed this. After rail track, we'd lost a bit of confidence. The Chancellor has come back, and we feel better about new Labour. Jeff, thanks. Football and Ireland celebrating tonight after becoming the 31st country to qualify for next year's World Cup finals. Mick McCarthy's men won their trip to Korea and Japan despite a 1-0 defeat in Iran today. Their home win at the weekend was enough to secure an overall 2-1 aggregate victory. The bars were full, outside the streets almost empty. Much of Dublin had come to a standstill as fans left work and headed for the nearest TV screen. They were to be in for a tense afternoon. Only the athleticism of the Irish keeper Shea Given kept the scores level. Iran needed at least two goals. They had enough chances, but struggled to apply the finishing touch. The home side did eventually break through the Irish defence once, but by then the match was in injury time, and it was too late. Back in Dublin, the final whistle was the signal for the celebrations to begin. It's now uh, 27 minutes past 10. I'll be back a little later with an update on the day's headlines. But now we join our news teams across the UK. Hello, good evening. From Look North, I'm Ian White. And we're on the air with a breaking story. A disused farm in West Yorkshire has been searched as part of an ongoing nationwide operation against the real IRA. Anti-terrorist branch officers, West Yorkshire Police and the Fire Brigade have been at the scene. Local people have been evacuated from their homes in the village of West Ardsley near Leeds while controlled explosions were carried out. Well, for the very latest, I'm joined by our reporter, Mark Saxby. Mark, you've been there several hours. What's been going on? Well, since around half past two today, Batley Road in West Ardsley has been closed off as armed police conducted a search of a disused pig uh, building, big pig farm building on the, on the Batley Road. They've asked residents, first of all, to stay in their homes. Then they asked them to leave their homes while controlled explosions have been carried out. In fact, we know of at least four controlled explosions that have been carried out today. And uh, police with armed, uh, with armed police have been just surrounding the farm and uh, we've been waiting for further developments from there. So, remarkable scenes, Mark. Have the police said much this evening? What we have found out is that uh, it, the actual farm was a, uh, a dissident Irish Republican arms dump, uh, which has come as a, an amazing surprise to the people of West Arsley. There's been talk that it's been, been watched for 18 months. Uh, and so people have been saying, well, what, what situation have we been put into? Have, we, have, our, have, our, lives been, have our lives been in danger? Um, and just been completely shocked by what's been happening here in West Arsley today. Very quickly, Mark, uh, what, what's going to be happening next then? Is uh, the situation calming down now? Well, residents still haven't been allowed back in their homes. They've been told it could be at least another two hours before they come back. But it is, quite, it is calming down. Police say they're going to carry out no more searches before tomorrow morning. But they are still blockading part of the road. OK, Mark Saxby, thank you very much indeed. That's our reporter live at the scene. Well, earlier we spoke to some of the people who'd been moved out of the area. This is what they have to say. On my way home, obviously I came up the alley and there's all police officer, officers blocking the road. So I went all the way around, and the same at the other side. So I came back and said nobody's allowed up. So I managed to get up, uh, went in my house, and next thing I know there's somebody knocking at the door, police officer again, saying there's going to be a controlled explosion, can you leave your house? So obviously I did, and we've heard a couple of explosions. I know they have had two, two explosions, so 
we're not letting anybody back at the moment. I've been uh, waiting since uh, four o'clock um, when I get back home. But, uh, there's nobody telling us what's going on and all that lot. And of course more on that story on your BBC local radio station. The next scheduled bulletin is at 11 o'clock. Now more news and an elderly woman is seriously ill in hospital after being knocked down by a police car which was answering an emergency call in Leeds. The police Complaints Authority investigation is now underway into the accident which happened near the Chain Bull pub in Harrogate Road in Moortown this morning. The 78-year-old woman is being treated at Leeds General Infirmary where her condition is described as poorly. We offer our deepest sympathy to the woman's family and as we speak as opposite to the her husband in Leeds are still damping down after a huge fire at a hotel in the city. More than 60 firefighters were called to the Wheatwood Hall Hotel after fire engulfed the roof. The building on the Leeds Ring Road was evacuated safely. Full investigation is still going on at the scene. Police in South Yorkshire have given more details about a man wanted in connection with the murder of Sheffield prostitute Michaela Haig. Michaela was stabbed to death in the lower Burngreave area of the city. The man police want to question is white, in his 30s, six feet tall, with short brown hair and possibly receding. He wore a dark blue fleece top and was driving a dark blue Ford Sierra, which had a roof rack. Waiting for a bus will never be the same again in Sheffield with the introduction of a new system. People tired of unpredictable timetables can now find out exactly when their bus is due through a mobile phone. Use WAP technology, the phone links up with an electronic timetable tailor-made to each bus stop. It's hoped the scheme will persuade commuters to ditch their cars and to take public transport. Well now sport and it wasn't much of a surprise was it but Sheffield Wednesday unveiled their new manager this morning Terry Yorath but the former Wales manager has only been given until the end of the season to prove himself. Here's Simon Clark. These are the glory days Sheffield Wednesday fans are hoping Terry Yorath can bring back to Hillsborough. It has to be said that his appointment hasn't been universally greeted with joy. But at a news conference this morning, Yorath spelt out what he feels needs to be done in the coming weeks to restore fortunes. Uh, I think if we continue with the spirit that we've got at the moment and the way that we've been playing, I think we'll pick up more points than, than we lose. Um, obviously, there's certain departments of the, the team and the, the squad that need strengthening, you know, and that's something I've got to talk to the board about. We do have uh, a longer-term business plan. We do have uh, expectation that uh, the improved uh, staff now that we've got will get better out of the players. And one of those new members of staff is Manchester City's Willie Donachie, lured across the Pennines on a two and a half year contract as Yorth's assistant. The former Scotland defender has a strong reputation in the game as a leading coach. And coming here is a big challenge and a chance to work with, with good players and young players and hopefully help them fulfill their potential. The new management team face a huge test on Sunday when they play at Leaders, Wilkins and Wanderers. Well now let's have a look at the regional weather prospects and uh, tonight will be dry, we'll be coming out with patchy mist and fog. Minimum temperature of 3 Celsius and that is uh, 37 Fahrenheit. Tomorrow mist and fog will lift tomorrow morning with sunny spells developing later in the day. Temperatures will reach a top of 12 degrees Celsius and that's 54 Fahrenheit and looking forward to Saturday and the weekend continuing dry with some sunny periods. Finally before we go let me remind you of our main story this evening. Anti-terrorist police investigating recent bomb attacks have sealed off part of West Ardley near Leeds. Three controlled explosions at least have taken place tonight and snipers and armed police are at the scene. Residents have been unable to return to their homes. More on your BBC local radio station at 11 o'clock and on tomorrow. For now, good night. And the main news again tonight are the British commandos are tonight in Afghanistan to clear a path for a larger human Jalalabad has fallen but the Taliban are said to be on their ground in Kandahar. On Newsnight, over on BBC Two, an exclusive interview with the Italian scientist who plans to come to Britain within days to start cloning humans. Talk News, good night. Good evening to you. I don't think we're going to need quite so many blankets on the beds tonight. Not as cold as it was last night, not as much frost around. But we haven't seen the last of the frost. We still have high pressure, well and truly in charge. Some mist and fog forming through the night, and it'll probably stay dry into next week. 
But temperatures tonight nowhere near as low as I mentioned than we saw last night. So we're probably looking at figures as low as one or two degrees, just about cold enough for a touch of frost, a lot more cloud floating around. But that frost will return, especially in the second half of the weekend as we start to see those blues reappear. And those are those nighttime temperatures at or just below freezing. So the risk of frost, especially for the northern half of the United Kingdom, from Sunday night onwards. Well, back to what's happening for the here and now. We still have high pressure firmly in charge. Good time to set your barometer, in fact, with pressure at around 1,043 millibars. Now, those weather fronts are still a bit troublesome. They've produced a fair amount of cloud, and that cloud will be thick enough across the more northern part of the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland, and the north and west of Scotland, seeing some outbreaks of rain through the weekend. And that high pressure re-establishes itself as we move into the early part of next week. Now, we do have some mist and fog around. That'll be the problem with high pressure at this time of year. Some fog patches tonight and first thing tomorrow morning, so some quite tricky driving conditions to watch out for. You slow down and take care. The fog making it quite dangerous. And a lot of cloud floating around compared to what we saw last night, especially in the south. And that cloud will be with us first thing in the morning. Just a quick reminder of the temperatures. There we go. We'll probably find no lower than five or six degrees. We'll hold on to a lot of clouds through the night. But it does mean a very misty, murky, grey, well, a disappointing start to the day. We saw first thing this morning, at least anyway. And then more cloud and rain back into western Ireland, western parts of Ireland, and also the north and the west of Scotland through the afternoon. Meanwhile, the sunshine tries to get through, but as I say, a rather cloudy scene for a good part of the day. And a top temperature probably up to the west of Scotland, although we'll see some patchy rain. The mild air coming off the Atlantic giving some good temperatures here. And where the mist lingers, it could be no higher than around 6 degrees, for instance, from the Midlands down to the southeast of England. On to the weekend forecast. Well, not too bad. A lot of dry weather to be had. But not much changing really, a lot of mist, a lot of low cloud, making it disappointingly cloudy in places. Thickish cloud moving back into Ireland and the western side of Scotland at times will bring some outbreaks of rain here and there. And that's the way we move into Sunday as well. Temperature wise we're looking at just about double figures in Scotland, but further south with the mist and the low cloud no higher than around 8 or 9 degrees. Back to Spend some time with the stars this Saturday night on BBC One. Television. Philip, can you reveal the jackpot for this week's lottery? Oh, well, that's a great I'll be looking at four of my favourite artists. The impressionists were seen as the bad boys. They really shook things up. I'll be getting out my brushes and having a go myself. I'm going to look at how they lived and worked and try and see how they created the masterpieces that we all know and love. Rolf on Art, Sunday at 6.55. Join me on BBC One. Have your say now on BBC One Question Time with David Dimbleby. Tonight on Question Time, Labour Party Chairman and Cabinet Minister Charles Clark. Shadow Transport Secretary, Theresa May. Mary Colvin of the Sunday Times, award-winning war correspondent, still recovering from injuries received in the conflict in Sri Lanka. The Virgin Rail and Airline boss, Sir Richard Branson. And Piers Morgan, editor of The Mirror. Thank you very much. Good evening. Well, we're in Norwich, and uh, as you know, the panel don't know the questions. People in Norwich who've asked them do, and I know some of them. So let's take the first one, which comes from Joe Mooney, who is a transport manager. Joe Mooney. The tactics used by US and UK forces have been vindicated. In the light of this success, has the time come for the wobblers to hang their heads in shame? Stick to the question, everybody, please. Charles Clark. I think the policy has been vindicated. 
I think the fact is we're making a major offensive to isolate the Al Qaeda gang in Bin Laden. I think we've established a situation where it's possible to imagine feeding the people of Afghanistan in a way that wasn't imaginable uh, even a week ago, uh, despite the big efforts uh, being made to put food in. The Taliban was stopping it, it's less able to do it. I'm not really one of the hang your hand in shame uh, brigade. I think that we need a, a debate in this country between different points of view. And that's the kind of society actually which we're trying to fight to defend, which the uh, Taliban and the Al Qaeda are trying to destroy. I think we need a liberal democracy in which people can put their different points of view. And it's very strongly, though, I do disagree with some of the points that were put by many of the people who argued uh, in the run up to this conflict. I think it's right that they were able to express it as they were, and I think we have a society that's worth defending. So I don't think hang your heads in shame is right, but I certainly think the government policy and indeed the whole coalition policy has been entirely vindicated. There's a great deal more to be done, a great deal still to be achieved, but we have taken the first steps uh, towards making real progress. The joy yeah. of some of the people in those towns in Afghanistan uh, at the departure of the Taliban I think was genuinely uplifting. Piers Morgan, you were uh, described as a wobbler. Uh, do you hang your head in shame? Were you wrong? No, I mean, I, I think it's extraordinary that anyone should think that we've won this war. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the